We continue the Desert Fathers translations of Helen Waddell with the Pratum Spiritual of John Moscus, translated from the Greek by Ambrose of Tamaldoli. John Moscus was a romantic. He called his collection of stories of the fathers, Limon, the watermelon, R, green pastures, and dedicating it to his friend, Sophronius, the scholar, he wrote a little parable of flowering fields in spring and how color and fragrance alike hold the wayfarer from passing on and how he has woven him this garland from those unwithering and eternal fields. The preface was written in Rome when he knew that he was near death, but he himself was a monk from the monastery of Theodosius in the solitude near Jerusalem, not far from where Laura fell into the Kedron, about the year that the emperor Maurice was killed. 602 of the Common Era. He set out on a pilgrimage through Egypt and finally to Rome where he died. He had asked Sophronius if it were possible to bring his body over sea and bury it with the fathers at Mount Sinai, but not if the barbarians were in turmoil to make the journey dangerous. Sophronius had brought his dead master as far as Ascalon when he had heard that Agarina were out, so he brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in the monastery where he had first renounced the world, in the cave where the three wise men had lain hidden from the wrath of Herod. He was a lover alike of men and beasts, and never weary of stories about the goodness and guilelessness of lions, and the wisdom of the little dog of the abbot of Subena Syrorum. As for Sophronius, the scholar, he was Patriarch of Jerusalem when he died, and a brief poem on Golgotha has set his name in that other unwithering garland, the Greek anthology. And it's quite an age, right, that you could carry around dead bodies and people would get too suspicious and all that. Um, and you can dig in graveyards and people wouldn't get too suspicious. You didn't have to do these things on an official basis. Um, but let's be real that um, burying anything anywhere except the area that it died, perhaps a different part of town than the other, um, but anywhere further than that was never anything that religion put merit on. Um, and it's quite the danger, because when you die, diseases that weren't troubling are no longer being controlled. Pratum Spiritual by John Moscus. One, there was a certain old man living in the monastery of the abbot Istorgius, John by name, whom the holy Elias, Archbishop of Jerusalem, would have set over the monastery. But he would not consent, saying, It is my will to go to Mount Sinai to pray there. The archbishop would have urged him to be made abbot first, and then to go where he willed. But when the old man would not agree, he was suffered to leave, promising that when he returned, he would take on himself the task of ruling. So after taking leave of the archbishop, he hastened to take the road, that he might come to Mount Sinai. And with him he took his disciple. He had forded the Jordan and gone hardly a stone's throw further, when he had felt a stiffness coming upon him, and a little while after he was seized by fever, and when the heat of the fever so mounted in him that he could not walk, they found a little cave and went into it to rest. But since the fever so weakened him that he could not move in that cave, they remained for three days. Then the old man in his sleep saw one standing by him and said, Tell me, old man, whither wouldst thou go? He answered, To Mount Sinai. And he said, Do not, I pray thee, go hence. And when he could not persuade the old man, he went away. 
but the fever besieged the old man closer. Again, the night following, the same man in the same garment stood beside the old man and said, Why, old man, wilt thou be made to suffer? Hear me, and go not hence. The old man said, Who art thou? And he that appeared to him said, I am John the Baptist, and for this cause I bid thee go no further, for this low cave is greater than Mount Sinai. For here did our Lord Jesus, when he came to visit us many a time, enter in. Promise me, therefore, that thou wilt make thy dwelling here, and I shall speedily give thee back thy health. And, uh, you know, if you step aside from ecclesial authority, you find that religion itself takes no part in this concept of, oh, we can just invent holy sites and it's about the personality. No, uh, whole, uh, the sacred calendar and the sacred days and such are never about a personality in revealed religion. I mean, sacred histories are compiled and priests say whatever. Uh, I was just listening to the book of Esther, and the book of Esther, it wasn't any, nothing about a prophet, nothing about God. Just, it throws in the rabbis decided to do something, right? Just like the Maccabees. Nothing about any prophets. It was, you know, all about giving an example of following the rabbis. Now, the Persians really don't like that sort of, but anyways, uh, that's kind of off the point. Uh, and the old man hearing this gladly promised he was to abide in that same cave, and straight away he was made whole, and there did abide for the rest of his days. And he made the cave a church, and gathered brethren together. The place is called Sepsas. Beside it on the left is the brook Kerith, to which Elias was sent in the time of the drought from the other side of the Jordan to that same place of Sepsas. In it there dwelt in a cave another old man of so great virtue that he would welcome the lions into his cave with him and offer them food in his lap. So full of the divine grace was the man of God. Now, it's important to, you know, establish a place for your survival, but second after that is to establish a place of worship. Um, seven. Another old man lived in the same monastery of Tres, and the fathers of the monastery would have made him abbot. For he was a great man and famous for his virtues. But the old man entreated them, saying, Forgive me, father, and leave me to weep my sins. I have not merit enough to take the cure of souls. It is a business for fathers great and excellent. Antony, Pacamius, the holy dead are. But the brethren would not consent, and day after day they beseeched him. And the old man, seeing himself oppressed by them, said to them, Suffer me three days to pray, and whatever God shall bid me do, I shall do it. That day was Good Friday, and on the Sabbath, early in the morning, he fell asleep. And by the Sabbath, I'm sure they mean Sunday, not the sunset on Friday, the sunset on Saturday thing you find in the Bible. 9. In that monastery of Turris, there was an old man that was an earnest lover of holy poverty and almsgiving. So one day there came a poor man to his cell, asking alms. And since the old man had but one loaf, he brought it out and gave it to the poor man. Then said the beggar, I do not want bread, but I want clothes. And the old man, wishing to score him, took his hand and brought him into the cell. But the beggar seemed not of any kind in the cell, save only the clothes the old man wore. And moved by his great goodness, opened his wallet and emptied whatever he had in the midst of the cell, saying, Take these, good father, and I shall ask somewhere else for whatever I need. 14. A certain old man lived in the monastery at Kuzaba, of whom the old men of the palace told us that when he was in his own village, it was his custom if he saw anyone in the village, unable through poverty to sow his field, he would go by night carrying seed with him and sow the poor man's field, the owner knowing nothing of it. And when he came to the desert and lived in the monastery at Kuzaba, he did the same works of compassion, 
for he would go along the road that leads from the Jordan to the holy city, carrying bread and water, and if he saw someone growing weary, he would shoulder his load, and climb as far as the holy mount of Olives, and return again with others by the same road, carrying their burdens as far as Jericho. You might have seen the old man sometimes carrying a huge bundle and sweating under his load, sometimes carrying a youngster on his shoulder, sometimes too. Sometimes he would be sitting, patching the broken shoes of some man or woman he used to carry with him. Whatever was needed for that task, he would give some a drink of the water that he carried, and others he would give bread, and indeed, if he should come on any naked, he would give him the cloak that he wore. It was sweet to see the old man toiling day after day, and if he found one dead on the road, he would say over him the wanted psalms and prayers and give him burial. 34. The holy city had another patriarch, Alexander by name, so good, merciful, compassionate, that when one of his notaries stole his gold and fled in fear to Egypt, to Thebaid, uh, to Thebaid and his wandering and in his wanderings lost his way and fell among thieves and was carried off captive to the utter to the Thibet. and in his wanderings lost his way and fell among thieves and was carried off captive in the uttermost parts of Egypt the good Alexander hearing of it redeemed him a prisoner in bonds for 85 pieces of silver and on his return he used him with such kindness and compassion that a certain man of the townsfolk said nothing so profitable as to sin against Alexander. 90. The fathers in that same monastery of the abbot Theodosius in the desert near Jerusalem told us of another old man saying, There was an old man in this place who died a little while ago, Pardus by name, a Roman. In his younger days he had been a man of consequence, but one day he had gone to Jericho with mules, and while he was in the inn, there was a little lad about, and by the devil's doing, a mule struck him with his hoof and killed him. The abbot Pardus, knowing nothing of it, but he was sorely distressed for it, and went into Arnon and became a hermit, forever grieving and saying, I have committed murder, and as a murderer am I in judgment condemned. Now there was a lion in that place near the brook. And each day the abbot Pardus would go to the den of the lion, goading and provoking him to rise up and devour him. The lion did him no manner of hurt. Then the old man, seeing that he made no way, said to himself, I shall sleep on the path whereby the lion goes to the river, and when he comes by on his way to drink, he will devour me. But as he lay low in a while, the lion kept as if endowed with reason. He leapt over the old man as peaceable as might be, and touched him not at all. Then was the old man assured that God had remitted his sins and returned again to his monastery and lived in great continence, edifying all men by his example till the day of his death. Now, that's not quite the same thing as going to battle or performing a dangerous task. That is sort of a suicide attempt, don't you think? And we all know what uh, even compiled religion tends to say about, uh, well, I mean, you know, sacred history attempts rather than revelation attempt things even say about suicide, you know. Um, Ninety-seven. We came myself and Sophronius the scholar to the monastery of Calamon beside the sacred Jordan to the abbot Alexander, and with him we found two monks from the monastery of Sabena Sororum, they told us this story, saying, Ten days ago there came one that entertained pilgrims, dispensing alms, and coming to Sviba, the Sorum. He gave an offering, and then he asked the abbot of the monastery, saying, Of thy charity send word to thy neighboring monastery of Sororum to come themselves for their offering, and bid them tell the monastery of Karembe to come likewise. So... The abbot sent a brother to the abbot of Sabena Sororum, and the brother made his way thither, and said to the abbot, Come to the monastery of Besorum, and send word to the monastery of Karembe to come also. But the old man made answer, Forgive me, my brother, I have no one to send, but of thy perfect charity to go thyself and give the message. 
Then said the brother, I have never gone thither, nor do I know the way. Then the old man said to his little dog, Go with this brother as far as the monastery at Karembe, so that he may give his message. And the dog went away with the brother, till he brought him in front of the gate of the monastery. And the brothers who told us the story showed us the dog himself, for they had him with them. 98. There is by the Dead Sea a mountain called Mardes, exceeding high. In that mountain hermits dwell, but they have a garden at the foot of the mountain about six milestones distant from them round the margin of the sea, and there they have a serving man. So if at any time they wish to send for vegetables, they saddle the donkey and say to him, Go to the garden to the serving man and bring us vegetables. And he goes off by himself to the gardener and stands in front of the gate and knocks upon it with his head. And straight away the gardener comes out and loads him with vegetables and sends him away with his load. Daily you may see the donkey climbing up and climbing down and ministering to the old men, but he will obey no man else. 93. Oh, wait, no, no, uh, wrong place. Um, 863. Yeah, that's quite a bit off, right? <laughs> um, the abbot Alexander, father of the monastery of Kalaman beside the Jordan, used to tell this story. One day I was with the abbot Paul Haladikas in his cave, and behold, one came and knocked, and the old man went out and opened the door. And bringing forth bread and peas that had been steeped, set it before him, and he ate. Now I thought it might be a pilgrim, and looking through the window I saw it was a lion. So I said to the old man, Tell me, father, why dost thou give him to eat? And he said to me, Because I admonished him to do hurt to none, neither man nor beast, and said to him, Come every day, I will give thee thy food. And behold, this is now the seventh month since he hath come twice in the day and I give him to eat. Again, after a few days, I went out to him to buy a wine jar from him, for that was the old man's trade. And I said to him, What ails thee, father? How goes it with thy lion? And he said to me, Badly. And I said, How? And he said, The other day he came here, that I might give him to eat, but I saw his chin stained with blood. And I said to him, What is this? Thou hast been disobedient to me, and hast eaten flesh. Blessed be God, I shall give thee no more, a devourer of flesh, eating the bread of the fathers, begone. But he was unwilling to go away. Then I took a rope and troubled it and gave him three blows with it, and he went away. Well, perhaps could have been a compromise and said, you know, lion, just don't eat humans. Leave the humans alone. Um, 867. The abbot Akthonicus, head of the monastery of our holy father Saba, used to tell I went down one day into Ruba to make my way to the abbot Pomen, the solitary, and when I had found him and he had told him my thoughts, he sent me, when it came to evening, into a cave. It was winter, and that night was bitter chill, and I was stiff with the fierceness of the cold. The old man came to me in the morning and said to me, What ails thee, my son? I said to him, Forgive me, father, but I passed a bitter night with the cold. He said to me, For my part, my son, I felt no cold. I was mightily astonished to hear it, for indeed he was naked. And I said to him, Of thy charity, tell me how it came that thou didst not feel so fierce to frost. And he said to me, There came a lion, and it went to sleep beside me, and he kept me warm. Um, of course, a lot of this is likely perception and not, uh, you know, not physical reality. Um, but there can be a spiritual reality, you'd say. Um, certainly beings that weren't physical are said to have come to these individuals. Um, now, one of the things to follow with this is like the Ashanti tribe down, oh, I forget where in Africa they are, but they had this idea of not just uh, sympathetic magic or low magic or whatever, well, I mean, not entirely the same thing, but that there are spiritual entities, particularly the transcendent one, that sort of demanded worship. And not just some partnership to, per se, 
accomplish something, although that can be part of it. And why Jesus and the angels and the saints and stuff ended up being worshipped is for much the same reason as one sees there. Is that, you know, the correspondence feature. Although the correspondence of the transcendent one covers all that.